Uh, hello, everyone. I wanted to welcome you on behalf of ISNMSC webinar series. This session will be have a 45 minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of Q&A session. You may submit your questions via the chat box throughout the session. We will address the questions in the order they are received. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Agaro, who is a professor of radiology and nuclear medicine and the chief of the Division of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging at Stanford University Medical Center. Mr. Agaro completed his medical school at Carol de Vila University of Medicine in Romania, and he began his residency at University of Southern California, Los Angeles in the Division of Nuclear Medicine. Dr. Agaro finished his residency and completed a PET CT fellowship at Stanford University School of Medicine in the Division of Nuclear Medicine. His research interests include PET MRI and PET CT for early cancer detection, clinical translation of novel PET radiopharmaceuticals, peptide based diagnostic imaging and therapy, and targeted radionuclide therapies. And uh, Mr. Ag Dr. Agaro has received multiple awards. And the most distinguished ones are the 2020 Sanjeev Sam Gambhir Distinguished Scientist Award, Western Regional SNM, and the 2022 Sanjeev Sam Gambhir Trailblazer Award, SNMMI. Dr. Agaro has published more than 210 papers in peer reviewed journals, as well as nine book chapters and one book. I warmly welcome Dr. Agaro. Dr. Agaro. Thank you so much. It's uh, with pleasure and honor to be part of this group. I know some of you, and I, I, I know that uh, India will be the featured country at SMMI annual meeting this year in June. So I look forward to meeting many, many more and uh, get to know you. And um, if you will be interested in visiting Stanford, um, we'll be more than happy to, to welcome you. Um, I, yeah, I just want to add one more thing, Andre, that this uh, webinar is actually the ISNM Missy webinar was set up to honor Sam Gambier and no one better than you to, to give this webinar because you trained with him, you know him so well. So I just wanted to point out that we are very delighted that, that you're talking for us. It's, it's an even greater honor, Amal. Thank you so much for saying that. Uh, before I get to, to uh, the topic of today's presentation, just give you a, a brief background to, to Stanford and to Stanford Nuclear Medicine in particular. Last year, we celebrated the Diamond Jubilee, so 75th anniversary of, of nuclear medicine at Stanford. Uh, it started in uh, 1947. The Department of Radiology actually celebrated 100 years a decade ago. So uh, we, we, we started a little bit earlier than radiology, but that's always the case. So Stanford University, it's a relatively new, uh, even by US standards, it was established in 1885, uh, opened in 1891. It started off of a family tragedy with uh, the, the Stanford's losing their teenage son to typhoid fever after a trip to Europe, and they wanted to honor his memory by actually making a donation to Harvard, uh, but Harvard did not want to put uh, their son's name on the building, so they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll open a university, and, uh, you know, ironically, in 2014, New York Times had a, an article that said that Harvard is the Stanford of the East, so uh, I think they were pretty successful. Um, uh, it has seven schools. The most recent one uh, is, is the School of, uh, of Sustainability. But uh, there are currently 21 Nobel Prize winners on campus. And, uh, you know, we're talking about Sam. I'm convinced that if he if he lived longer, he, he would have been one of the Nobel Prize uh, winners. Um, overall, there's 36 Nobel Prize winners since uh, the university was founded. Also, for those who follow mathematics, the Turing Award, there are seven of those winners. And for those who follow sports, uh, 296 students from Stanford uh, won Olympic medals. Um, and then chances are you're using one of these, the product from one of these companies on, on the right. They were all studied uh, by graduates or students at Stanford. Back to nuclear medicine, uh, Professor Newell uh, resigned as head of radiology to start this new discipline using isotopes at Stanford. And a decade later, Dr. Joe Chris took over from him. Uh, Dr. Chris is uh, very well known um, for uh, finding uh, the uh, antibody that was causing hyperthyroidism, uh, Graves' disease, and also together with colleagues in radiation oncology. At that time, radiation oncology, radiology, and nuclear medicine were all one department. Um, finding the treatment for, for um, eye disease in, in graves. Uh, 
so he was also uh, one of the first people to use computers um, in medicine and he created he generated art using computers and we still have a collection of his art on display uh, he was followed by uh, Dr. Ross McDougall, who he, uh, does not require introduction, world expert in all aspects related to thyroid, uh, and then by Dr. Bill Strauss, uh, cardiovascular expert. But really, things have changed once we were fortunate to recruit Sam in 2003, and Sam, over his decade plus of, of leadership, both in nuclear medicine and radiology, established several extraordinary programs. Uh, on the left, it's a clinical Part of nuclear medicine. I'll tell you more about it. Um, then on the right, uh, he worked hard on establishing a second radiochemistry facility and all these centers at the bottom, Canary Center for Early Cancer Detection, Precision Health uh, Medicine, Find Molecular Imaging Program, and uh, Nanotechnology Center. They require no, no introduction. So um, Sam left a fantastic mark on, on many aspects of Stanford University. One of the uh, reasons for him to be pride was uh, to be proud was that uh, Stanford research was recognized in radiology over, over a year as second only to uh, MGH, Mass General, but that's a much larger institution. Uh, so if you normalize the number of faculty, uh, Stanford Radiology is number one as far as research uh, amounts from the NIH. So now on to our topic, um, a decade plus of gastrin peptide receptor PET. Where are we and where are we going? If I were to make on a joke on April Fools, which is today, at least in the US, uh, I would say we have approval for by the FDA for one of these traces, but we don't. But hopefully I will convince you that um, we, we're getting closer to that step. You're very familiar with the prostate-specific membrane antigen. It's probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest success stories um, of the last decade for nuclear medicine, and I would say for oncology, and it's a fantastic misnomer. It's not prostate specific. It's overexpressed in up to 90% of prostate cancer. It's in fact, as you know, just uh, an enzyme, uh, a carboxypeptidase. On the other side of the screen, you have the structure of the gastrin leasing peptide receptor, uh, which is overexpressed in a variety of cancers, including prostate cancer, but also breast, small cell lung cancer, uh, GI stromal tumors, as well as on the uh, tumor vessels of urinary tract cancer. So how do they behave uh, uh, against each other? There's something that I will try to show you data uh, during this presentation. Um, right now, the field looking at GRPR, and I'm going to use interchangeably gas leasing peptide receptor, GRPR and bombesine, uh, is focused on antagonists. The early efforts a couple of decades ago, we we're looking at agonists, but it turns out if you inject agonists, even in the very small amounts uh, that are required for PET imaging, you elicit um, um, adverse reactions in the patients, GI uh, adverse reactions. However, with antagonists, this is not an issue. There are no adverse events. And it turns out that the signal, the tumor to background ratio is even higher. There are several compounds that have been translated um, into humans. There are several other more that are currently under trials but I'm gonna focus most of my presentation on the one at the top, gallium 68 IM2. That's the one that we used in hundreds of patients at Stanford. The other one that is currently uh, in, in uh, phase one, two trials uh, with Novartis is Neobomb. Uh, and this was something developed uh, by Dr. Mayna Nock and then further developed um, by the group at Erasmus with uh, Professor De Jong um, and then uh, published by, uh, as always, uh, Dr. Baum, who, who is a pioneer um, whenever it comes to something novel. This is one of the first uh, publications on Neobomb. Uh, there's several others um, uh, showing its utility, but as I said, I'm going to focus on another one. So if you look at the normal bar distribution, um, in the U.S., we have PSMA11 and PYL approved by the FDA. They look like this, a normal uptake in lacrimal glands, salivary glands, some uptake in liver and spleen, uh, clearance and uh, also um, uh, binding in the kidneys as well as some um, hepatobiliary clearance and uh, GI uptake. On the other side, if you look at the, and this applies to most of these bombesine class of radiopharmaceuticals, the image is very clean above the diaphragm. There's now nothing in the mediastinum, no, no salivary gland, no lacrimal gland, so a potential advantage there. There's very little hepatobiliary clearance most of the clearance from the body is through the kidneys, but there's no renal binding. So you're not concerned about renal toxicity if you consider something like this for therapy. 
And of course, a little bit of GI track uptake, you see the distal esophagus as well as rectum. And a large amount of uptake in the pancreas. That's where these peptides are overexpressed for their physiologic status. But the pancreas is radio resistant. And as you will see later on, the activity washes out from the pancreas by 24 hours. So the, the, the pancreas is actually not the dose limiting organ. Now, if we look at the course of prostate cancer from initial diagnosis, local therapy, followed by first line hormonal therapy, second line hormonal therapy, et cetera, I think that at the very early stages of disease, if you have access to PET-MR, it is the best tool because nothing beats MRI for the anatomical uh, delineation of the prostate and the pelvic structures and really nothing beats PET as far as functional evaluation uh, throughout the body. As we go to later stages of disease, PET CT is much faster. Digital PET provides um, excellent image quality. And later on, once we start talking about therapies, radionuclide therapies, PET CT plays a role as well. So let's start um, by looking at this continuum of disease. So uh, this was just published online in November um, in Journal of Nuclear Medicine. We wanted to see if we can help men um, who have uh, rising PSA um, or PSA density and negative biopsies of the prostate. Can we use PET in combination with MRI uh, to identify disease? So this is the study design. Uh, as I said, men with negative or equivocal MRI, negative biopsy and persistently elevated PSA underwent both PSMA-11 and bombesin uh, PET-MRI. It turns out that we're quite successful in identifying uh, clinically significant prostate cancer, uh, again, in men who had pyrads one, two, or three, so with non-contributory MRI. And this is one such example. So the top row is the PSMA-11, showing some uptake at the apex of the gland anteriorly. Um, I would argue that the, the signal is even more intense with bombesin in this case. If you look in panel C uh, at the top right, that's the prostate gland on MRI and the green dots were the um, needle tracks from the biopsy that was not guided by PET. So you can see how despite the best attempts by the urologist, the cancer marked in red was actually missed. Uh, and that's not surprising. The anterior aspect of the prostate is difficult to biopsy even for the best urologist out there. And here at the bottom right, you have a 3D rendering of the prostate gland with the prostate cancer, and now the needle tracks that were guided by PET, some of them including in the area where the cancer was located. So uh, one example where we're able uh, to help not just the urologist, but also the patient uh, uh, avoiding repeated biopsies and anxiety and follow-up, and perhaps in the future with larger number of patients, even being able to show uh, that we have uh, improvement in, in outcomes of these patients by detecting this cancer at earlier PSA values when they have a better chance of being cured for disease. Now, the next step in the evaluation of these patients, some of them with intermediate risk or low risk, are choosing to, to not undergo prostatectomy. They're, they're choosing to undergo uh, local focal therapy. One of these is high-intensity focused ultrasound. So you're really heating up the cancer that you know in the prostate gland without doing damage to the normal prostate. This was also just recently published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. So we used both PSMA-11 and bombesin PET-MRI for this indication. Here, there are two aspects that are very important. Number one is you need to know about all the cancers in the gland. When you do HIFU, you treat what you see. And if, you, if you're not aware about other cancers, that's failure of treatment, obviously. So we wanted to see if we detect additional cancers over MRI. We also wanted to, to see by repeating the PET-MRI scan six months after treatment, if we can avoid biopsying these men to assess response to treatment. In other words, is the drop in signal on PET indicative of PSA response and therefore um, avoiding uh, biopsy, re-biopsying this man? So this is one such example. The top row is... <clears throat> pre hyphal On MRI, the green dots are the uh, benign tissue from biopsy. In orange, is the non-clinically significant, so 3 plus 3 glisson. And in red, is the clinically significant cancer, in this case, 3 plus 4. The bombesin scan uh, shows uh, the cancer in the uh, right aspect of the peripheral zone of the prostate gland. Um, you see excretion in the urethra in the center. The PSMA shows the same. Post-treatment, the signal is gone on both RM2 
uh, and PSMA11. There's a new area of signal on the left side, which on rebiopsy was a non-clinically significant 3 plus 3 prostate cancer. So important to know, A, that the treatment was successful, and B, that the other cancer lesion out there is not clinically significant. So it doesn't require aggressive treatment. It can just be followed up. Along the same vein, another focal treatment, it's high-dose rate brachytherapy. So here we're doing the same thing. We're doing PET-MR before and it's six months after focal therapy. In this case, perhaps less significant because when you do uh, high-dose rate brachytherapy to the prostate, the entire gland gets some radiation. It's not just the area treated. But nevertheless, we wanted to see if this concept works. And this is one patient on the left with focal uptake, biopsy proven recurrent prostate cancer, 3 plus 4, radiated, and the signal is gone. And on biopsying, and the PSA numbers show that there's no more disease. This is another example, uh, pre hifu very intense focal uptake um, in the anterior aspect of the gland on both RM2 and to a certain degree on PSMA11. I don't want you to take home the message that, that this is always the case that RM2 is uh, more focal, more intense than PSMA. I'm showing you cases that illustrate the fact that we need more traces, no matter how good PSMA11 or PYL are. Biology is tricky, so we need to have access to, to more targets for the use. We have more data in the pre-prostatectomy setting. So this is the publication also last year in the journal of nuclear medicine, um, looking at bombesin uh, PET in about 40 or so patients uh, uh, with newly diagnosed intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer. So uh, the plan for the study was for each of these men to undergo bombesin PET followed by prostatectomy and nodal dissection to identify its performance. Um, about Three quarters of the patient ended up with surgery. The other in the end chose um, uh, radiation therapy. So uh, we did not include them in the end. But the point of this table is to show that the intensity in the prostate cancer, it's higher than in normal tissue and normal lymph nodes. That's statistically significant. And also the intensity of uptake in the primary lesion versus nodal metastasis. So histology proven nodal metastasis, it's higher. And that's also statistically significant. But like, Every imaging modality, if you have micrometastasis in lymph nodes, no PET tracer will be able to find all of them. So the performance was good for the primary cancer, not so good for nodal disease, which is the same for all the PSMA agents. The beauty of, uh, of this study is that our urologists are doing a 3D mold of the prostate based on the prostate MRI. Then they take the prostate out in one piece. It's sent in this 3D mold to pathology where it's sectioned. The pathologists are marking the cancer in ink, and you can see here the cancer in the anterior aspect of the gland correlating very nicely with where the signal was on bombesin, so very intense uptake in the anterior aspect of the gland. And these slides are sent to PACS, so we can review PET MRI pathology side by side to make sure that what we've called on imaging, it's real. Um, and we have colleagues who are now working on the uh, non-rigid co-registration of PET, MRI, and histopathology blocks uh, so that this can be seen in 3D as well. There is a statistically significant difference between the intensity of uptake uh, with a, a PSA cutoff of five, so uh, higher uptake um, in, in the patients presenting with the PSA greater than five, and that correlates with the risk. That if those are patients at higher risk for overall evaluation of disease. And there's also a predictive value, um, an SUV of uh, less than 10 or greater than 10 in the primary lesion is, seems to be predictive of the time uh, to the next biochemical recurrence. And of course, it makes sense if you have lymph nodes present on PET imaging, it means that you probably have other lesions that are not identifiable in imaging, which will lead to a recurrence sooner than if you don't have uh, lymph nodes with uptake on, on bombesin scan. So this is data that's very similar to what has been published for uh, PSMA11 or PYL as well. Now, a subgroup of these patients um, had PSMA11 as well. So how did the two compare? Uh, this is a little bit uh, of a crowded table. O only 13 of these 40 or so patients had both PSMA and bombesin. But what I would like to focus is the fact that the agreement between the two scans was poor. And usually that's a bad thing. But here, I think it's a good thing because it shows that you need more than one biological target in, in order to accurately identify disease. Um, and let me show you some examples here. 
So the top row is the PSMA 11 and the bottom row is the bombesin, the same patient. All of these were done within a couple of weeks of each other. So the primary cancer easily identifiable, identifiable on both in the right aspect of the prostate gland. However, I would argue that this presacral slash perirectal um, lymph node, it's more conspicuous on the bombesin scan at the bottom than it is on the PSMA um, at the top. Uh, in addition to that, uh, with PSMA, you can have presacral uh, sympathetic tissue that uh, may confuse better. So perhaps one potential advantage is in that area. This is another example where the cancer was uh, seen um, on the right aspect of the gland uh, with bombesin, and I don't think that you can call it uh, even knowing where it is um, on the corresponding PSMA 11 images. And this is what I meant by uh, co-rigid registration of, of, of signals. So at the bottom, you have pathology, um, MRI, the two of them fused together, and then fused together with the area that had the strongest signal uh, on, on PET. And in addition to that, while we see the lesion on the right on both PSMA at the bottom and bombesin at the top, there's an, uh, another cancer on the left side of the gland uh, that you, you only see with bombesin. So you would say it doesn't matter the pathology uh, that the prostate will sit in a jar in pathology after prostatectomy but i think that if these men choose to undergo local therapies it is important to be aware of all the cancers that are present in the gland now this summarizes the findings um, that are different in red uh, in these patients who had both rm2 and bombesin uh, and PSMA 11, and, and you will see that there are differences not just in the prior, but also in the presence or absence of nodal disease. And the panel on the right shows left column bombesin, right column PSMA, one cancer seen on PSMA only, another cancer seen on bombesin only, a lymph node seen on both, and then at the bottom, a lymph node that I would say is perhaps a little bit more conspicuous on bombesin than on uh, PSMA. Now, if you look at the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy in this cohort, um, uh, you would see that um, the sensitivity are more or less similar and the accuracy between RM2 and PSMA11, they're both superior to that of multiparamagic MRI, which is not surprising. Um, the specificity seems a little bit higher with PSMA than with gallium. And there are um, newer reports showing that um, you have a higher degree of uptake of uh, bombesin uh, agents in benign prostate hypertrophy than you do have with PSMA11. Now, our largest experience with bombesin PET is at biochemical recurrence. It makes sense that's the largest population um, of patients that we see in, in our clinics. So here we ran a phase one study, a proof of concept, 10 participants. Then we expanded to a phase two study with 21 participants. And then we just completed a phase two, three study with another 100 participants. These were planned um, in 2013-2014. So at that time, standard of care was bone scan and CT or MRI. The eligibility criteria were negative bone scan, negative CT or MRI, despite rising PSA by AUA and astrophenix criteria. So after that, these patients underwent an RM2 PET-MR, and you may wonder why PET-MR, because again, in 2013, digital PET was only available in PET-MRI, and we felt that you want to give the best PET available uh, for these studies. And there was no PSMA available to us at that time. So that's why not all the patients underwent PSMA. As the study progressed, some of these patients underwent PSMA. I'm going to show you that data as well. But so the first publication came out in 2016, and we had seven patients out of the 10 um, who had both bombesin and PSMA 11. And interestingly, the first patient ever studied with both had more extensive nodal disease in the retroperitoneum with bombesin than on PSMA. So for all it's worth, we were on to a good start with bombesin, and we focused in our attention on that. This made the journal cover in JNM at that time. The next cohort, the 20 or so patients, showed two things. Obviously, the greater uh, um, the PSA value, the higher the chances of finding disease. That's a top graph. Interestingly, at the bottom, the PSA velocity, which is a marker of tumor aggressiveness, was higher in patients with positive scans than in those with negative scans. So that raises the question, are we able to find more aggressive recurrences with bombesin? In other words, if the scan is negative, are those patients having more indolent cancer? So maybe we should not jump to, to treat these patients. 
we need more more participants to to make that diagnosis but interestingly we were able to find tiny lymph nodes in the pelvis as is the example on the top as well as new findings like this liver capsule implants that in this case was biopsy proven to be recurrent prostate cancer the only recurrence um, in this particular patient so these new agents allow us to identify new patterns of spread or of recurrence of, of prostate cancer that before were thought to be very rare and they're not now, if we look at the positivity rates, and these are the 100 patients from the phase two, three study. PSA quartile under 0 0.5, about 40, 41%. So this is actually comparable to the reports of PSMA um, PET, which are anywhere from 30 to 50% in this quartile. And then as you go to higher quartiles, the positivity rates increase. Um, and on average, it's about two thirds of these patients would have uh, a positive bombesine PET despite negative bone scan CT or MRI. And of course, you may argue that that's irrelevant. How about comparison with PSMA? And I'll show you some data there as well. Now, if you look at the detection rates per PSA quartile, uh, the bombesine against MRI at each of the quartiles PET, it's more sensitivity than more sensitive than MRI. And that should be not surprising at all. These differences are statistically significant. In the last part of the study, we also looked at changes in management. So for the 33 patients where we are able to modify the protocol, we received responses from uh, their treating physician in 20 of them. And for majority of them, there was upstaging. For some of them, was downstaging. And for about a third, there were no changes based, based on the uh, bombesine PET scan. Here are some examples. As I was showing earlier, you can find tiny lymph nodes in the pelvis. Um, as well as in this case, uh, uh, recurrence um, um, next to the prostate gland. Um, but tiny lymph nodes can be easily seen there. So another example, higher PSA, um, in this case, there was a bony lesion um, in the ischium, so it, it has pretty intense uptake. Um, even higher uptake, you can see not just bony lesions, as is the case here, but also lymph nodes extending all the way to the left supraclavicular space in this case, um, and the rib lesion as well. And because it's done with PET-MR, the, the PET is always on in these scanners. So we, when we do a, a dedicated prostate MR, we have a high quality PET of the pelvis, which is the image on the right hip. And then we do a quick um, whole body PET as well. So, okay, so now looking at the data from the 50 or so of these 100 patients who had both PSMA and bombesin, uh, this was published already also in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, and you can see that the uptake in general is similar in the primary, uh, seems to be higher with PSMA in lymph nodes uh, and um, uh, as well as in bony metastasis. Here are some examples. So on the left, we have the bombesin per MR. On the right, we have the PSMA 11 per MR. And I would say that some of these lesions, like this one in the thoracic spine, has higher uptake with uh, bombesin than on PSMA, and there are other lesions like this one in the um, humerus that it's visible um, with bombesin and is not visible with PSMA 11. And you have cases like this where because there's no liver or very little um, liver clearance, um, the adrenal metastasis is very conspicuous on bombesin um, and on PET, it's, it blends in with PSMA. Of course, on CT, there's a nodule that should not be missed, but the intensity of uptake is higher. So if you have a case like this and you think about diagnostics, which one would you choose? I would make the argument that you should clearly go with the bombesin agent uh, to attempt therapy, not with the PSMA, given the, the better uh, lesion to background ratio with, with bombesin. And then, of course, it's all not it's not all like that. This is an example where the bombesin is negative and PSMA shows multiple tiny bone marrow lesions. So obviously, if a patient looks up like this, you will want to treat with PSMA, not with bombesin. If you look at the overall distribution of uh, lesions in these 50 patients, 70 lesions were seen with both tracers, but seven were seen only on bombesin, 36 were seen only with PSMA. Most of the 36 were multiple bony lesions in one single patient. So I would say, if you think diagnostics for these seven patients with lesions seen only with bombesin, obviously the choice is lutetium bombesin. For this other patient, conversely, obviously the choice is PSMA. 
But what about the other that show the same lesions? Would it not make sense to try to perhaps alternate cycles in order to reduce toxicity? As you know, they're very well aware of the salivary gland toxicity and Luis alpha uh, uh, PSMA lacrimal gland toxicity as well. So can we achieve similar or even better outcomes if we alternate cycles while reducing toxicity? I hope to be able to, to do some of that research in the future. This issue of PSA velocity um, held up in this cohort. So statistically significant difference between patients with positive bombesine uh, and negative bombesine, which was not the case in the cohort that had uh, PSMA. Now, given that there are multiple other companies, um, Novartis, Orano Med, um, Clarity, doing uh, research in the space of bombesine PET, should we not have a standardized interpretation of these images? I certainly think that we should. And so for that, we, we, we evaluated a modified PROMIS criteria. So the PROMIS criteria is here on the left. These are the scores that are assigned re relative to blood pool, liver, salivary gland. Um, and then we modified it looking at the normal biodistribution of bombesine PET to, to look at blood pool, GI tract, and pancreas. So this is work that's uh, in, yeah, publication, in publication now. I don't know if someone hey, can, can you can can you meet uh Ruchi, can you meet whoever is talking? So Sorry, if you look at the interreader agreement here, uh it's substantial to almost perfect for all these aspects. So we're seeing that uh, now we're ready to put forward a set of interpretation criteria for bombesine PET, and this will be another step in standardizing how this research is being conducted. So let me um, end with a few words about Theranoxic in PET. So this is adapted from a review paper by uh, Mike Hoffman and Rod Hicks, um, substituting uh, RM2 for PSMA or Dodatate. So there are versions of bombesine that have been labeled with lutetium-177 and actinium-225. Lutetium RM2 has been used in humans. There are only preclinical data with actinium-225. These are images from our friends and colleagues in Santiago de Chile uh, who did the first patient uh, with lutetium RM2. You can see images up to 168 hours. This was very extensive disease. You see the pancreas at 24 hours, but then it washes out to the point where you don't really see it. And interestingly, the, the metastatic lesions continue to demonstrate uptake of this tracer. Um, these uh, findings were confirmed by the group in Rostock who published the dosimetry of lutetium RM2. And at the top, you see gallium-68 RM2. The pancreas is there. At the bottom, 45 hours, the pancreas washed out. Everything else that was metastatic prostate cancer still demonstrates uptake. So these are pharmacokinetics that suggest that lutetium RM2 is proper for patient treatment. I do think that we should not be focused on the very late stages of disease because there pretty much every receptor is gone. But I do think that at the earlier stages of disease, these may be complementary to PSMA diagnostics. And as I said, I want to acknowledge the therapy trials that are ongoing by different companies. Another very interesting um, work has been done by uh, Thomas Gunther um, while a uh, postdoc at uh, Technical University in Munich. He will join us at Stanford in May. And he showed that uh, if you do a substitution uh, of the tryptophan in the structure of RM2, you make this molecule more stable and also more with higher affinity and tumor retention. And you can see the, the tumor model implanted in the shoulder of this mouse has signal on RM2, but the signal is much greater with a new molecule, AMTG. So very exciting to, to see the first results of this, um, also from the group in Rostock and hopefully from our group as well going forward. So uh, to conclude on my wish list, um, I, I hope I convinced you that over the past 10 decades, um, we've made great progress in showing the utility of this class of agents at all uh, 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 stages of prostate cancer. Uh, we're now ready for the next generation um, of these molecules and really hoping to see multi-centered, uh, properly designed prospective studies uh, with defined indications. Um, and, you, you know, I don't think that we need PSMA number 10. 
or 11 or 12 when we have PSMA agents that work so well. Uh, I, I think that we should um, uh, focus on other targets and one of these may be bombesin. And um, when we meet again in the future, hopefully by the end of the next decade, let's hope to have at least one of these class of agents approved by the FDA. So I want to uh, acknowledge my colleagues who work in this space and uh, did a lot of the work, Lucia, Guido, Heng, Valentina, Farshad, and Hong, as well as people in the international nuclear medicine community who helped a lot. Professor Mackey uh, is the inventor of, of RM2 and then all the others who provide us data for PSMA 11 and, and RM2 early on. Um, as well as the funding, uh, the large phase two three study was funded by the Department of Defense through an impact award. And the lecture is dedicated to Sam. Uh, I want to end uh, with this image of him. Uh, it's a collage of uh, multiple hundreds or thousands of pictures taken over the time of when he was at Stanford to recreate his portrait. And then this is from when he received the award uh, at SNMI in 2018. And he ended by saying that his journey was a 30 plus years that was unplanned. But what he respects and treasures most is how we treat each other. And I don't see that anyone was treating people with more respect than Sam was, no matter how important or not you thought you were. He, he, he was always very kind and generous and an open door uh, uh, to his office, to anyone who wanted to talk to him. So uh, in that spirit, nuclear medicine is a small community. And I think that we can replicate the same way of treating each other with respect and as a professional timing. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Agaro. Excellent talk and very useful information. Now I'll open the floor for questions. Yeah, there is already one by uh, Dr. Halka here. Uh, great talks, lots of useful information. Was neuroendocrine staining like synaptophysin chromogranin stains performed on specimens of metastasis that showed discordant results in PSMA scan and Bombesin scan? That that's a that's a great. Um, <clears throat> Question. There's actually a group at Vanderbilt University in neurology um, who looked at neuroendocrine prostate cancer, and they showed actually this overexpression of GRPR in that population, but that's less than two or three percent of, of overall prostate cancers. Um, we try doing stains for, for GRPR, actually, that there are antibodies that can be used to stain to do immunohistochemistry. Um, but it's not very easy to do. So we're not very successful. We, we tried, and I didn't show you this, but we tried this in breast cancer. In breast cancer, it was much easier to do the stains for the immunohistochemistry stains for, for GRPR. What we've been successful to show is that there is discrepancy in the overall expression of, of these receptors. That they're, they're not spatially congruent. So the PSMA and the GRPR are not spatially congruent on the samples where we're able to stain them uh, at the same time. And that's work that uh, Wolfgang Weber and his group has done as well when he was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they took surgical samples, stained them with both, and they showed that there is incongruence of the signal. Thank you. Any more questions? Great talk, Andre. Um, so it looks like this is also another pan cancer agent, right? It, it's not yep. specific to prostate per se, but it's uh, the, the gastrin release in peptide receptor seems to be overexpressed in a in a number of cancers, mm -hmm. including breast and ovarian and small cell lung and, and others. And I think some of the receptors um, uh, may be overexpressed in other organs. The good thing is it, it seems to be less uh, expressed in physiologic tissues uh, that, that PSMA has. But as prostate cancer patients live longer and longer, we are seeing uh, not commonly seen metastasis in these patients. Like I've seen patients with brain meds and liver meds and lung meds with prostate cancer increasingly in the past. It, it just wasn't the case. It, it was probably there. We just didn't have a time like time to diagnose them. Uh, now they're, they're basically living longer. Uh, but in that setting, they may also have other primary cancers, like they may develop, uh, you know, other cancers. And, and so you still are, are restricted to biopsy sampling of these lesions, right? Uh, especially the unusual ones. So any any thoughts or comments on, on that uh, aspect of, of uh, molecular imaging? Because that's 
that's one of the pet peeves that, that our referring physicians have, that we still have to biopsy these things because it's not specific. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we biopsied at the beginning of that phase one, two study, we biopsied pretty much every patient um, in the first 10 or 15. And by luck, um, they're all true positive. So then the referring physicians started believing that that's real, right? So they, they order less and less biopsies. But it's biology, and you will have false positives. We know now that BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy, is a false positive. We also found weird things like a um, neural sheet tumor in, in the mediastinum, so a schwannoma, mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. actually lit up on both PSMA and bombesia. Oh, okay. But I do think that in an ideal world, someone is diagnosed with prostate cancer, you do both scans. And if one is positive, the other one is negative, you know what to follow up, right? And then mm -hmm. over the course of disease, if if despite proof of recurrence biologically, the scan is negative, then we switch to the other target, right? So we need to to get more data to try to have a predictor when someone is diagnosed as to what that person's phenotype will be in the next decade or so. What is he or she for other disease more likely to overexpress? And because economically you cannot scan everybody with all the tracers that are out there. So we need to be smarter about how we use them. Yeah, that was my next thing I was going to ask. Like when you said that in the ideal world, we, we need to scan them with both the traces, but economically it just, at least in the US, it just not does not make sense yep. because <laughs> the high cost of, of these uh, agents, I mean, you, now the cost of um, just the radiopharmaceuticals is, you know, three to $5,000 uh, plus the cost of PET. Uh, on top of that, availability is an issue, insurance is an issue. And uh, our fiscal environment just does not support it. So are, are, is any work being done where these new traces would fit in the grand scheme of things and, and how we should proceed? Well, I mean, um, we work with JOSNA, for example, a number of years ago on a cocktail sodium fluoride and FDG, right? So mm -hmm. um, I can foresee where now a decade plus later with the use of artificial intelligence, you can model a little bit the behavior of, of one versus the other. So I have colleagues who are thinking of, of doing just that, right? So if, you, if you're able to do a cocktail pet, injecting mm -hmm. two traces at one time, at least you eliminate the technical fee from, from one of them, right? You yeah. still have the cost of the radio pharmaceutical. So depending on how you look at it, that's good for the patient. That's bad for the practice because you can only charge once right so there, there's no clear winner one way or, or another but it's clear to me that you cannot keep adding i mean this is just one right you, you mm -hmm. have new par other tracers that can work in prostate cancer you cannot do 10 scans in each patient right can't you as you said yeah. you you can barely do two right if at all even when it's properly indicated right like for screening for pluvicto right ideally you would be able to do both fdg and psma but you rarely are able to do both. So we need to be smarter about that and how we approach it. So any any thoughts about uh, <clears throat> looking at the dynamics of uptake of various tracers and separate them temporarily? Um, use, because the modern scanners, uh, as, as the scanner technology is improving, we are, we are able to do scans faster and faster. And larger like if you if you have the the uc davis explorer or 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 the siemens quadra you know you can do uh, almost a whole body in one bed position right and so that that opens up avenues for you know temporal separation of of scans because they're done much faster and uh, i don't know if if uh, in we can add throw in uh, different positrons uh, based on like gallium versus copper, because I think Clarity uses copper 64 as, the, as their labeling right, agent. Right. So gallium versus copper versus F18, um, plus the temporal differences in the uptake between say PSMA and, and Bombesin, and somehow uh, make that talk using, again, I think it's gonna be difficult for the human eye to see these things, but if you use AI based uh, algorithms to separate out, can we eke out uh, these differences in the cocktail and make it be better because uh, I mean, realistically speaking, nobody else other than Stanford people did the cocktail for sodium fluoride and, and FDG. 
and 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 the reason is uh you know people just don't know how to use it and and if sodium fluoride was not is not reimbursed so that's another big issue in the us but any thoughts in in, in that matter yeah no i think that the <clears throat> the cocktail work was a little bit ahead of its time uh, then um but you're right one way is to look at the dynamics of the two tracers the other way is to actually change the design of the detector and that's work that some of our physicists are are, are working on and others are working on where you can actually separate the signal even from positrons having the same 511 kV so there, there are many ways but we're just scratching the surface of this in, in fact <clears throat> we reached out to the FDA a couple of years ago asking if we can do this cocktail and they said at that time that no because neither of them was FDA approved so um now and you <clears throat> we cannot mix them in the same syringe because then there it's considered a new drug so you need to give them sequentially mm -hmm. so um you know work to be done yeah definitely work to be done but it's it's i mean we academic centers somehow need to come up with with plans to mitigate the financial aspects uh, of these uh, for example, you know, when, when the uh, UCLA, uh, no, you, I think it, it was UCSF folks, Palm Hopes group that came up with the Gallium uh, 68 PSMA, uh, FDA approval before anything else, or the Mayo Clinic doing the uh, choline for prostate, those were kind of limited to their centers, and it did not become universally available uh, in the U.S., um, on the other hand, you know, Europe and even Asia seem to get their act much faster and, and do these things um, on a more broader scale. And, and I think it's the onus is on big and distinguished academic practices like Stanford and others to come up with innovative ways to, to level the playing field in the US. Because even now, a significant chunk of uh, the US in the mid part does not have access to, to FES, Theriana. You know, a city like New Orleans, I, I don't think has access to uh, FPS and it's been FDA approved for almost three years now. So we have to, you know, make sure that our tools are available uh, to the to the general population in the U.S. Otherwise, you know, it, it's we are already seeing that uh, even in radiopharmaceutical therapies, there's a lack of availability of the resources and the personnel to deliver these therapies and, and somebody else will do what because the patients need to be treated. So they'll come up with ways to treat the patient. And, and I think the onus is on us to, to think along these lines as, as future leaders in the field. Right, I see another question about yeah, how another accurate was bombazine for prostatectomy bed and the, whether we use diuretics. So uh, good question. We, we, we never use diuretics either for PSMA or for bombazine. Um, when when we started using that per MR, we worked with the engineers at the vendor to develop a scatter correction for for gallium. So uh, we did not see the halo artifacts. And is it possible that we miss some cancers? Probably, if if very close to the bladder. But I, I, I say that the accuracy was not lower in the prostate versus other parts of the body. In fact, most of the cancers, and in all the patient pre prostatectomy other than one that did not have expression of, of GRPR, we were able to see the primary in, in, in the remaining 41 or 42 patients. But it's a good question. And we don't put folic catheters either. Can you uh, say a couple of uh, things about your PET-MR protocol? How, how do you do the, the, the overall like, uh, yeah. acquisition? Yeah, yeah. So, um, we want to get it So the longest part. It's actually the MR, not the PET for a change. So um, the prostate MR is 20 to 25 minutes, right? So mm -hmm. we inject the patient, wait for the first 30 minutes for the uptake, and then we start with a 20 minute prostate protocol. And that gives us a 20 minutes PET of the pelvis, which is very okay. high quality. And then we do a very quick one to two minutes per bed body because we've seen that even in high-risk pre-prostatectomy patients the rate of metastatic disease outside the pelvis is around 10 percent or so so we don't need to spend a lot of time of, on, on whole body MR 
So we, we do PEREMAR now mainly for pre-prostatectomy in intermediate and high risk, and for these focal therapies, HIFU and HDR bracket therapy. For biochemical recurrence, unless it's very early recurrence with suspected disease in the pelvis, we do PET-CT. So uh, the thing I was trying to get at was the 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 super pets that we call because of the simultaneous acquisition of pet and MR, where in the pelvis we get a 25 minute pet that's because we're acquiring MR, why not just get the pet? And then, um, you know, depending on the protocol, you could either do that before or after the whole body. Usually we prefer it before for most cases, except maybe for some, uh, because sometimes the patient can't tolerate it. But uh, any thoughts about looking at the, the lesions that you see on the, the super pets versus the whole body and eke out the differences and, and see if that helps with differentiating between, say, BPH and, and low-grade tumors versus high-grade tumors? Um, so I think in, in theory, it's a good thought. We didn't do it in practice because these were highly selected patients for whom BPH was eliminated. So... They, they were high risk. We knew already that they had cancer. We did not, I mean, the images look prettier, but we did not see more lesions on the dedicated yeah. pelvic than standard PEREMOR. So you can that. make the argument that, you, you know, it's an extra that makes for images to show in a presentation, but not necessarily <laughs> changes in yeah, management. That's... Yeah, the images certainly look prettier for sure. We have a question from Dr. Halkar in the chat box. Um, the question is, how accurate was bombesin for detecting recurrences in the prostatectomy bed with intense uptake in the bladder? Do you use diuretics before scanning? I think Simon already addressed it. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi. Well, that was a good talk. I'm Raghu Halkar. Um, even in the Exomin study that we did at Emory, um, we, there was a heavy referral bias. Most of the patient had prostatectomy and rising PSA. So even if you ask me after working with Axumen for many, many years, even in the development, how, how it would look in a, a prostatitis case, I won't be able to tell right. how intense will be uptake because we have never done a case of prostatitis. So that's one of the downside is we never have a two by two table in many of uh, in medical practice. We only look at disease patient. We never look at normal patient. And even when we got the grant, uh, the NIH reviewers never asked us, why are you not doing any street, take up some 100 patients of elderly patients and do their scan. They would not because it's difficult if, if it turns out to be positive in a patient who has never had a uh, a history of prostate cancer to biopsy him and to do everything becomes much much more difficult so yeah and by uh, by accident i think that there is a paper from a group in china that looked to it's a, a derivative of rm2 rm26 in 200 something patients without a diagnosis of prostate cancer right which is a scenario that we, we will never do pet before this patient have a rectal exam or uh, or or um, um, an ultrasound or something like that. And there they show a large, it's exactly the study that you didn't do. Uh, they show a lot of bombesin uptake in BPH, right? But that, that's, that's not to say that bombesin is not useful because if you know that someone has BPH, you stop, you don't pursue, uh, that's the source of rising PSA. You, you don't need to do other imaging. Right, so it's an artificially created scenario that we don't, at least in the US, we don't encounter in clinical practice because PET is not the first go to modality for these newly diagnosed patients. They, they undergo digital exam, PSA, PSA density, ultrasound, MRI. If all of this fail, then they may be sent for PET. So by and then, if someone had BPH, MRI is actually really good at finding BPH. Unfortunately, BPH and uh, prostate cancer do not coexist very often. They are usually not, do not coexist. They do sometimes, but not always. Exactly. So exactly. that's one, uh, one favor to our side. Exactly. Someone has another question. 
Yeah, one of the questions in the chat box is on the same lines that we have been discussing so far. Do you think bombesin scores over PSMA scan as we can't do complementary imaging in every patient? Well, that's a million dollar question, figuring out which patients should get one versus the other. Um, the answer right now is I don't know um, because as I've shown you, at initial diagnosis, you find some non-clinically significant cancer, so that would indicate low aggressiveness. But then at bi the biochemical recurrence, the PSA velocity is greater for patients with positive bombesin. So something switches from localized cancer to metastatic cancer. That's my theory here. And if you look at the biology literature, bombesin have, have been looked at for three decades in lung cancer and breast cancer. And they've shown that if a metastatic lesion is aggressive, it in part is because of the GRPR overexpression. So the, these receptors play a role in, in the metastatic potential of a disease. So how, how the cancer changes from a less aggressive early on to a metastatic more aggressive later on, it's something above my pay grade and knowledge as far as biology. But I think that that's where we should focus um, our attention. Because you're right, we need to to be able to come up with a score that will tell us this patient needs this scan and this patient needs this scan because we cannot do everything. It's too expensive. <clears throat> that was my precise earlier question about uh, uh, neuroendocrine staining. Mm -hmm. uh, a prostate cancer at initial diagnosis may not have neuroendocrine stain positive, but when it metastatizes, it may change into neuroendocrine, develop neuroendocrine features. Right. And that's why um, in a urologist study showing that neuroendocrine differentiation is only two, less than 2% in prostate cancer, may not hold good in a metastatic prostate cancer. It may be 30%, 40%. Right, and, and that's a, yeah, obviously in the world of pathology and neurology, that's a raging debate, right? About um, what, what is the correct percentage of those patients? Yeah. But the other thing is for, for pathology, you're, you're limited to what you sample and you never sample all the lesions. So that's going to be a big aliasing effect there itself. So, And I think not only for the metastatic potential, I think neuron differentiation also indicates resistance to common treatments. So it's it's an important aspect that, that, that potentially we may be able to help if we have better traces. Well, it this certainly is an additional tool in the armamentarium of fighting prostate cancer. So uh, that is for sure. Yeah, and we're still using Axumin. So you didn't ask <laughs> the question, but I, I wanted to, to just say that we still have patients where we find it useful. Uh, yeah, but again, um, um, Axumin is not a theranostic agent and uh, PSMA and uh, the, the strength comes in the theranostic part of these two agents. And um, we, we have done a, a few PSMA treatment here, but we have not experienced any dry mouth or anything like that, but it's probably too early to tell. Maybe it will, uh, in terms of salivary gland uptake and the, uh, in the lutetium PSMA, but as here, uh, Bombesin doesn't have the salivary gland uptake. And we have not been giving any cold compresses to the salivary glands also, isn't it, Simon? No, and I think it's a, it was a soft call even on the ENM guidelines that they don't highly recommend it. It's just optional. I think it's placebo. Yeah. 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 No, excellent talk. Very good discussion. Uh, I thank you, Dr. Agaro, for your time. And it's a pleasure and honor to have you on this forum, especially because uh, our webinar series, as uh, Amul mentioned, is dedicated to Dr. Gambir. So uh, great honor. Thank you. Thank you as well. Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Have a Thanks, Andre. Bye -bye. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.